All right, so we are officially live. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today with Palm Beach Tech. Uh, today we have our guest, Carrie from General Assembly and she'll be introducing Terry. Um, before we get started, I kind of just want to talk about who we are as an organization. Um, we're building South Florida into a tech hub and our goal is to deliver the best value to our members and community. So Carrie, you can go ahead and take it over and introduce Terry. Yes, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for connecting today. We are super excited to do our second workshop with Palm Beach Tech. General Assembly, I'll share a little bit of what we do and then I'll, I'll introduce our guest of honor today, Terry. Um, General Assembly is a tech education company founded in New York in 2011. And our mission is to help adults transition into careers in technology through coding, UX design, data science, and also digital marketing product management. Um, and what we really do is gather the community to create thought leadership around tech and to build tech talent, tech talent pipelines and ensure that professionals are receiving the best skills education and are able to update their skills um, quickly and efficiently and in an agile manner. And so when we launch our campus in South Florida in November of 2019, so we're the, we're the new guys here, even though we've been around, we're the industry vets, um, we were super excited to connect with the community at Palm Beach Tech um, and just the Palm Beach area. To, to bring our talent, to bring our instruction, to bring our content to, to what it is, the South Florida ecosystem. And so today I'm super excited to have Terry Rice, one of our um, experts in residence. He is the founder of Terry Rice Consulting and he is also an expert in residence for Entrepreneur Magazine. Um, and he's a business consultant that has worked around digital marketing um, with, Walmart and Warby Parker and FedEx. And he has, um, he's really excited to be here today to talk about LinkedIn marketing and optimization uh, for you guys today. And so Terry, we were just talking about, you know, the workshops that you have done for Entrepreneur Magazine and that you have over a thousand people RSVP usually, and you've been part of South by Southwest and Techstars and um, obviously part of the whole entire New York ecosystem. So once again, thank you for being here and let's get started. Well, thanks for having me. I've never been introduced as a guest of honor before. So I'm, I'm flattered and I appreciate that. You are. Um, but before we officially get started, uh, I just wanna address everybody on a more personal level. So we're gonna be talking about LinkedIn marketing and optimization today. And I know it's gonna be very valuable and I'm looking forward to hearing your questions. But I just want to think about the times we're in right now. And I know some of you might be going through it to the point where maybe you're, you know, you got laid off or you're concerned about that. And I hear you, I understand you. But right now, I want you to do your best to just lock in and focus and get the most out of this next hour as you can. And I say it because back in 2008, I got laid off and I had about a thousand bucks left to my name. And the one thing I did was I invested in myself and my education. So I took a course that taught me how to do search engine marketing. And as a result of that, five months later, I got hired at Adobe as a search engine marketing consultant. So I literally went from having $7 in my pocket to making six figures a year. So it can happen for you as well, but the most important thing I can say to you today, outside of all this stuff, is just to keep on investing in yourself. Don't forget who you are, and you will get these, these outcomes you're looking for, but don't let this temporary situation impact how you feel about yourself and also impact the vision you have for your future. So I'll get off my soapbox. Uh, we're gonna talk about LinkedIn now, but I just wanted to bring that up because I do feel it's very important. So with that, I'm gonna try sharing my screen. This is normally the time when people mess up two or three times. So let's see if I nail it the first time to find out. But um, I'll just ask you now, can you see my screen okay? Wow, okay, so going pretty smooth so far, <laughs> but let's, uh, let's go ahead and get into it. So a bit more about my background. Uh, again, my name is Terry Rice and I'm a business consultant based here in, uh, in Brooklyn. And that's a very vague term, so I'll unpack that a bit. You know, previously, I was focusing more on digital marketing, working with clients like Walmart, Warby Parker, Bonobo, so on and so forth. But over the last few years, I've really been more rewarded by helping individuals, entrepreneurs, solopreneurs, people that maybe aren't as well known as a Warby Parker, but the results I can help them get have an impact on their life. They're more, more comfortable paying their bills or can go on vacation more often and have more time with their, their family. 
So that's really where I'm focusing these days. And normally what I do is I consult people who have their own consulting business, or maybe they monetize their knowledge through online courses or paid speaking gigs, things like that. And then outside of that, as Kari mentioned, I'm also an expert in residence at Entrepreneur Magazine. And another offshoot of that is I get to write for the website as well as the print publication. So I get to interview all these really great entrepreneurs and then practice their best practices on myself. And if it actually works, I pass it on to people like you. So that's what I'm here to talk about is some things I've learned from these other people that are doing really well in this case on LinkedIn. But that being said, uh, you see my email in here if you want to reach out, uh, if you want to connect on Instagram, LinkedIn, anywhere else, I'll give you all those, those links too. But um, that's me and that's what we're going to talk about. Cool. So here's the agenda. First thing is your profile optimization. How do you present yourself in a way that people, first of all, get what you want to do and want to align with you, want to connect with you, want to continue a conversation off of LinkedIn after you make that first introduction? And part of that is creating compelling content, right? If you're just on LinkedIn, just sending messages to people and like liking here and there, that's not going to do it. What you want to do is build a personal brand. That's the point of being on LinkedIn. It's not just you know, trying to find someone who you might want to work with or that you might want to align with for one reason or another. It's to build your personal brand. I'm going to give you tips on how to do that with intention. And then making the right connections. On my end, I'm always confused when I get random invites from people that don't have any context whatsoever. And I'm like, okay, you're a dairy farmer in New Zealand. Why, why are we connecting, right? So if you're going to connect, that, that, that definitely makes sense. But make sure you're being impactful with it because it does take time. And along those lines, playing the long game as well. So when you first do connect with someone, don't immediately try to figure out how you can make a buck here or there. Think, how can I build a relationship with this person? How can I learn from them, right? Not what can I get from them, but how can I learn from them? Because when you play that long game, people are more likely to align with you and help you reach the outcomes that you're ultimately looking for in your business and your personal life. So with that, let's go ahead and get into the first thing, which is your LinkedIn profile optimization. And before I do that, I want to bring up the fact that I have three kids. You might hear them running around the background. We'll see. Uh, but I bring that up to say I am used to getting interrupted. So as you have questions as I'm going through this content, please do ask them. And just I'll ask the moderators to pause me <laughs> and, and I will answer them. But this is not a monologue. This is a conversation. So as questions come up, please do ask them. And I'll give you my, my social handles so you can catch up with me afterwards if you need to as well. But First thing I want to bring up with LinkedIn optimization is there's no magic bullet. There's no step one, two, three, four, five, and boom, super successful. It's going to vary based on a lot of things. You know, who are you targeting? Is it B2B? Is it B2C? And the content you can produce. Do you feel comfortable on video? You know, do you want to do more long form content? Can you do, you know, short blog posts and things like that that would be beneficial? It could also be associations you partner with, because if you're working with a company like General Assembly, you might be able to write stuff on their behalf that they share with their audience. And therefore you're reaching a larger audience because of that association. And then lastly, how many clients or customers do you actually want to attract? So a lot of the work I'm doing right now is, is one-on-one. -on -one. So I'm working with consultants one-on-one -on -one to help them grow their business. I don't need 40 clients on a regular basis. That would be way too much, right? So just kind of realizing what volume of, of customers or clients do you need? It's all gonna vary. Uh, but the very first thing you want to start with is a good headline and a good headshot. Now, you might be surprised to know I'm actually very stoic. So my original uh, LinkedIn profile is just me just staring at the camera waiting for it to get over with. And as a result of that, I didn't get as many people reaching out to me. And when I did reach out to them, they were not as receptive. So you want to make sure that you're having a good first impression. Um, so even with your headline, you want to make sure that you use keywords that your audience is searching for or would resonate very well with them. And you can kind of play around with that. So if I'm a business development consultant, I would say I'm a business development consultant, right? If you're an app developer, you would say you're an app developer somewhere in your title to make sure that people know who you are. And when they're searching for app developer, you're more likely to show up. So I'll give you an example. This is my buddy, Mike Koenigs, and he's an entrepreneur, he's an author, he's a podcast host, he's also an investor. And he has all those things in his headline because that's who he wants to attract. But if you look at his, his picture and his cover, this is all very intentional too. So there's a picture of him looking very friendly and saying, hey, get paid for who you are, not just what you do. And then all these media outlets he's been featured in as well. 
right? Because he's building his personal brand with the way he presents himself. So that's Mike. Um, this is another friend of mine, Amina Altai, and she's a holistic business coach. I'll say that again. She's a holistic business coach. And more or less what that means is she'll help you improve your business by helping you improve your health, your actual physical health, and the health of your business in regards to the nuts and bolts of like profit and loss and stuff like that. But if you look at hers, it starts off by saying she's a business coach. And then she says, helping female entrepreneurs and leaders make work a place they, make work a place they freaking love, feel good, and get paid. And you might think, oh, wait, Terry, this is LinkedIn. Why is she being so unprofessional saying you make work a place you freaking love? It's because she wants to be polarizing. She does not want to appeal to everyone. If you're insulted by the fact that she said freaking, good. Because actually, Amina swears a lot. She looks very sweet and innocent. She swears a lot. In fact, she says, if we can't swear, we can't be friends. So she's trying to push some people away by saying, make place we you freaking love. Because a lot of people are going to not like that. The ones that are like, oh, I get her. I, you know, I feel this. They're going to want to associate with her. And I say this because there's 500 million people on LinkedIn. You probably only care about 5,000 of them. So focus on attracting them, not everyone else. And that's exactly what she's doing right here. Uh, next up, we have my buddy, Justin Doyle. So Justin Doyle is an executive coach. And he says, I help high achievers like you level up. So I met Justin back in early 2018 when he first started doing his, uh, his coaching business. And he was very intentional about everything he did, even the title that he gave himself. So we said he's an executive coach. And I said, well, are you more of a consultant or are you a coach? And he said, it's a mix of both, but I know coach is a more popular term for people who are looking for what I do. And I said, okay, well, well, how do you know that? He used a tool called Google Trends and make sure you write this down. So Google Trends is a way for you to research what keywords are getting a, a various amount of search volume. And in this case, the term executive coach when compared with the term executive consultant, gets more searches than executive, um, gets, gets more searches on, on Google, okay? So you see the blue line is executive coach, the red line is executive consultant. Therefore, if he wants to rank higher for people that are searching for these terms, he's gonna keep on calling himself an executive coach over and over and over again. So again, be intentional about how you're describing yourself in your profile, on your website, everywhere. And you can also kind of experiment and find the right balance because you can also overtly state what you do. So I'll, on mine, it says, I help consultants grow their brand and their revenue. But I've also experimented with using more searchable words like business development consultant, keynote speaker, NYU adjunct. And the fun thing is with LinkedIn, you can see what keywords you're showing up for. And I knew immediately after I made that change from having keynote speaker in my title to saying I help consultants grow their brain and revenue, I, can no I noticed that I was showing up less for the search term keynote speaker. I was okay with that though, because during uh, COVID, most people are not looking for keynote speakers. <laughs> so what I said was when I'm reaching out to people or when they reach out to me, I just want to be more overt about what I do. I help consultants grow their brain and revenue. That's it. That's what I'm focusing on. I'm not looking for speaking opportunities, except for today, because you guys are awesome. But you see what I'm saying? Like, you can actually test these things out and see what's working better. And you might change it based on what you're focusing on during that time period. So if you look at my profile, there's me looking at something aspirationally, and then my background. And then again, I have a cover photo as well, um, just showing uh, myself speaking on stage, right? So you want to have that, that context there as well. And when you do get, professional, get this photo, make sure it's done somewhat professionally. I mean, you don't have to necessarily pay someone, but it should not be you like at a bar where you just crop off someone's arm and you see it's like the hand on your shoulder still, like just actually get a real photo. And I've been that guy before because when I worked in house at Facebook and at Adobe, I wasn't on LinkedIn trying to get clients or build partnerships. So I didn't care. It was like me seriously at a bar with like a crooked hat on. I was like that guy with probably the drink in my hand. But as soon as I started my own company, I was like, okay, you have to look more approachable. And it's funny, like when I, when I changed from that Pratt guy picture <laughs> to when it was more serious, <laughs> there was a big change. And there's an even bigger change when I went back to me uh, went to have, and had one of me actually smiling, looking more approachable. So these are things that you wanna think about as you're doing this. 
a plain or neutral background smile. And then again, have that header background too. This is my friend, Lauren. She does a lot of speaking engagements. So she has a really good uh, profile photo. And then outside of that, you see her cover photo as well. And I know a lot of you probably aren't doing this. You might have that generic blue background. And I hear you, that's fine. But after today, you don't have an excuse. <laughs> you gotta make sure that you change that because that's how you're presenting yourself to your target audience. So I'm gonna take a breath here and see if there's any questions that I can address that might've come up. Yeah, so we do have one question from Allie. Um, she asked, do you have tips for headlines for recent graduates who might not have their own brand yet? Yeah, I would say, you can say, first of all, Allie, thank you for the question, but I would say you can say um, aspiring product manager or looking for roles in product management, something along those lines where at least like the term is in there and you can even say recent grad, but you still wanna show up for those terms and make it very clear uh, of what you wanna do and, and what situation you're in right now. And Allie, I, you didn't ask this question, but let me give you some more advice. Um, this is the step, unsolicited advice. If I was looking for a job right now, I would be posting and commenting like crazy in areas that are relevant to my, my field, whatever that is. If it's project management, you're always up there saying, oh, I just read this blog about project management. It's really amazing. Or here's what this company's doing with project management. It's really amazing. Do that as much as possible. Because if you are interviewing, it's a choice between Allie, who's posting all the time, and this other person who's not. Allie gets the job because it's very clear that even though you're out of school right now and you haven't been hired yet, you're still really, really focused on, on your industry. And that goes for anyone. It doesn't matter if you're you know, a recent grad or not, you got to post as much as you can about your, your industry because when someone's researching you, like, well, you know, during COVID, they didn't just sit around, you know, feeling upset they didn't have a job. They were just still on it every day. Wow, look how much they're posting. This is amazing. And it actually happened to one of my friends. She got laid off. This is post COVID but she was still posting on a regular basis and that's how she got hired. So a bit of a tangent, but hopefully that helps. Um, all right, so again, in regards to your profile, you wanna be presentable. Um, don't be this guy. Um, don't put a bunch of like crazy emojis or punctuation unless your audience responds to a bunch of crazy emojis or punctuation. Um, in this case, I actually know this guy personally and it's not working out too well for him. <laughs> he just won't take it down. Um, but you don't want to be that person. And, and I'm not saying you should be stiff, but be presentable, right? All this pow, pow, money stuff, it's not going to attract the, more, the right audience, most likely. What else? Another thing is to make sure you upload featured content. And this is relatively new. This is about maybe like three or four months old, maybe a little bit more. But featured content goes on your profile directly below your picture in your title, and it's when you can upload things such as your speaker reel, or maybe you have some kind of, I'll show this one, or maybe you have some kind of posts or articles you wanna share. Um, it can be an infographic, whatever it is. But this is really important because it's highlighted so prominently on your, on your profile. And I see, I don't know, maybe 30% of people actually use it. So again, if I'm Ali, that aspiring grad, I would have like a link to maybe some project that I worked on when I was in school or maybe a blog that I wrote for one organization or another. Or maybe you just put together a presentation that you've never delivered anywhere, but you're like, here's the five-step process to mastering project management, whatever it is. But please do not go forward after today without uploading some kind of featured content there because you're wasting real estate if you don't, okay? And if you want, it can just be one of your posts. It can be your post, it can be someone else's post, but you have no reason whatsoever to leave that part blank. Okay, so please make sure you have that featured content field available. Next up, create compelling content. Well, well how do you do that, right? What's, what's compelling? It's compelling as it relates to your audience. And that's why you have to be very specific about who you're trying to attract or who you wanna make an impression with in general. Because if you're trying to be the right person for everybody, you're just gonna be boring by default. So again, you have to be like Amina and show that personality in one degree or another. So first thing I wanna say is don't chase likes. You wanna focus on impact. I've had posts that got hundreds of likes and I really got nothing for it in return, except kind of some kind of validation. And then beyond that, when you chase likes, you somewhat associate your self-worth to how much engagement you're getting. And that, that's a dangerous spot to be, right? 
right? So you, you don't want to do that. You just want to keep on putting out that really good content that, that your audience is responding to, not hundreds and hundreds of people. And if you're short on time, you're better off focusing on quality over quantity. So you don't have to post every day. Maybe post every week, but make it more impactful. And your next question be like, might be like, well, what the hell should I post in the first place? You know your target audience. So think of 10 questions they have and then answer that with content. So if your target audience is project managers, you're gonna say, you know, how do you get started in project management? You know, what tools do you use in project management? So on and so forth, right? And then as you're doing this, you wanna make sure that you're asking questions that start a conversation. Anytime you post, you gotta realize that the reason why you're on social media is to be social. So I have to say like, here's my thoughts, peace. You wanna say, here are my thoughts, what would you add to this? Super important. So provide a reason for people to interact by just saying, okay, what would you add to this? You know, how do you feel about this? What's going on? So make sure you include those questions. So back to creating content for your audience. Again, this is Justin and he's an executive coach. So he's starting off by saying, as a private equity professional, you're a member of a very wealthy family. Well, Justin, actually I'm not, so I don't care anymore. I'm not gonna read the rest of that post, but Justin's audience is, and that's what he cares about. He doesn't care if he gets five likes, three likes, four likes or whatever, he's talking to his audience. And he does that with intent. So when I first met Justin back in 2018, he just started working, he just started his consulting business or coaching to use this term. And he was making about 2000 bucks a month. I talked to him a few months ago in 2019, he made $400,000. How do you do that? Just talking to his audience, not chasing likes, not worrying about you know, how many shares he got. He's like, I'm just gonna keep on consistently talking to my audience. So you have to be very clear on who you wanna make that impression with, right? Um, so here's one of mine. A common question I get is, how much should a consultant charge for their services? That's a question, I answered it with content. And a good pattern for you to get into is write a blog article that's, re that's relevant to your target audience and then tease it out on social media. Hey, are you curious about this? In my latest article, I talk about this, click here. If you just get in that pattern of doing it once a week, doing it twice a month, but just doing that, you'll have a lot of content on your website or it can be a LinkedIn article too. Maybe you don't want a website. You can have a LinkedIn article as well, which is pretty much a blog where you're going deeper on this topic. And again, if you can't do it every week, do it every two weeks. If you do it every two weeks, do it every, you know, once a month, but don't just do nothing, right? You gotta do something, even if it is challenging. Um, here's another one that came up. So a couple of weeks ago, uh, there was like that Blackout Tuesday, whenever it was like putting, posting a black square, especially on Instagram, um, in regards to George Floyd. And a lot of my clients were coming to me saying, Terry, I, what should I post on social media? Like, is it okay to post on social media right now? Are people gonna think that, um, you know, I, I don't care or that I'm tone deaf, you know, if I post something? And that's a very real consideration. So my answer was like, you know, you can say you're not saying whatever you want. Like, that's, that's how I feel about it. You know, so long as you can deal with the consequences. And then I went into um, Greg Glassman, who's the founder of CrossFit, who said some very disparaging things about George Floyd. And as a result is no longer the, the CEO of CrossFit. And I'm saying for him, like, you know, like one tweet makes a big difference. But for the rest of us, it's your actions that matter. It's not that you post a black square, you not post a black square. It's what are you doing going forward to make the world better? And I think there's going to be a reckoning coming very soon with all these companies who are saying, we love inclusive people and like yucky schmackety. Someone's going to say, okay, cool, show us your board. And if your board does not have people that are LGBTQ or other, other minorities, they're going to say, well, what happened to you being so inclusive? You talked about it, but you didn't actually live it. Right? So you can post or not post whatever you want, but you have to be prepared to deal with the consequences. And I feel very strongly about that. So that was my response. I'm like, do what you want, <laughs> as long as you can deal with the consequences. Um, and then another thing is you have to respond to all comments. If someone takes the time to comment on your, on your content, you have to respond to it. A few reasons. One, it helps the algorithm. The more people that comment and engage with your content, the better, including you. So if you get all these comments and you're engaging with them, it boosts you up in the algorithm because when you post, your, your content's being scored more or less. And the first hour is very important. 
So if you're getting a lot, a lot of likes and comments, that tells LinkedIn, oh, this is good content. I should show it to more people. But if you're not getting that engagement, then it says, okay, I guess it's not that good. So I won't show it to more people. So you wanna make sure that you are engaging when people comment on your posts. That's also why you should not accept any random LinkedIn requests because if someone, again, is a dairy farmer in New Zealand and I start posting about something that has to do with consulting, they don't care. LinkedIn's gonna be like, well, that dairy farmer didn't care, so no one else is gonna care either. Great, now no one else gets to see it because I kept on accepting all these random requests. So just pre-qualify why someone wants to be in your network because you actually are hurting yourself in your ability to get reach for your content if they don't engage with it. Terry, and we have a question from social media right now that says, what type of content gets, gets the most engagement? Personal post, asking questions, sharing expertise. What do you see as the most uh, effective? You can ask, I could say ask a question, but if it's a crappy question, that's not gonna matter, right? So I, I think questions do work very well. When you're asking for input from people, that works very well. I think personal ones work well too. And, and here's the thing, like I never want to exploit what's going on in my personal life, but this is a very true story. Uh, last week I posted about how I'm trying to finish this project. I'm building an, an on-demand course for people that want to become consultants. And during that time, my brother was admitted to the ICU. And I was like, this sucks. Um, and at the same time I was trying to record this course, I kept on messing up. Like I wasn't even plugging my mic in half the time. So I'm like, great, I have to re-record this. So I'm like, man, I'm frustrated, but you know, I have a vision for my future um, in regards to my business and my family. And that's why I have to push through these things. I'm gonna keep on pushing through. So for anyone else who's out there who's going through it, you're gonna wanna give up, but don't because you started this for a reason. So yeah, I mean, I talked about my brother being in ICU and that I'm sure that contributed to the engagement, but I wasn't looking for like sympathy. Like this is just my life, you know, I'm not saying like, you know, Here's another what was me post, it's Wednesday, it's what was me Wednesday. Um, so I wouldn't do that like consistently just to chase likes or anything, but people don't need to see you as being an expert all the time. They just see you as being a person. And for me, actually one of my most popular posts, and this is gonna sound counterintuitive, I was speaking at Amazon and there was a woman there who had a child who was maybe like seven years old and the kid kept on making noise to the point where she left. And in my head, I'm like, crap, I should have said something. I should have said, hey, ma'am, you know, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you chose to do this, you know, and take care of your kid as opposed to this or take care of your kid. Because I have three kids, you know, and I realized that. And that's what I posted the next day on LinkedIn. I was like, you know, I, I did a, a, a presentation at Amazon last night and I really messed up. I should have said something, you know, and I said, it's, it's not like I was rolling my eyes every time the kid said something, but I, I should have stopped and said, ma'am, I see you, I acknowledge you, and I'm glad you're here. That post got like 10,000 views and I got three paid speaking gigs from it. Now, the funny thing is I talked about how bad of a speaker I am and I still got <laughs> paid speaking gigs from it. But that was like, again, a personal post that, um, that resonated well. So what I want you all to do is to think about these micro moments that occur in your life that seem very insignificant. But when you express them to your audience in a way that, that tells the story, uh, does make sense and just shows you as a more, uh, just a real person, not someone who's just trying to sound professional on LinkedIn. And there's one more question from social that says, what if I don't have my own content to share? How do others view, view shared content? Is that better than nothing? Yeah, it's actually my next slide. So what you can also do is just follow relevant hashtags. So it could be project management and just engage, right? So you don't necessarily have to create content, but you have opinions, you have thoughts. So if someone says, oh, here's this new software that came up with project management, you're gonna say, oh yeah, I'd love that and here's why, right? So, and I hear you, like I, I am, when I was uh, on paternity leave with my son, Trevor, I couldn't write anything, I was tired. But what I said is I'm gonna comment 10 times a day. So literally while I was feeding my son, I would comment on social media. And you can say, hey, Terry, maybe be a dad instead, but <laughs> you can do both sometimes. <laughs> and um, so I would comment 10 times a day. And as a result of that, I actually got a client. And I think that contract was like between like five and $10,000. So just by, again, to answer that question, just by engaging with content, you can still express your expertise even while feeding a newborn. So it's, it's doable. And I would love for you to do that as opposed to nothing. 
uh, because it's, you're, you're, you're going to get used to engaging with an audience. You're going to comment back on your comments and you'll start these relationships. So I think that's, that's brilliant. Um, but my last point here is leave a real comment. Don't just say like, cool, and, <laughs> and, and stop. And if you share content, don't just share that article and be like, great article, because that, that's actually annoying. So like, just kind of pre-qualify why it's a great article. Give some kind of editorial context. Oh, I like how they broke down the three ways to do this. Great article, <laughs> right? But don't just say great article and then, and then leave. It's like, I don't care enough to, to read this right now. Um, I said this before, but you can also repurpose content um, from one platform to another. So write a blog and then share it on social media. And one of my most popular posts this year, that's what I did. I talked about how I got laid off, like I told you earlier in 2008, and how it launched my career. And that got like 70,000 views, a bunch of people engaging, so on and so forth. But that started off as a blog and just like a quick post on social media, right? So for those of you that are like, hey, it's kind of hard for me to create this stuff, you can also just take other content you already have and repurpose it. So please do that. Uh, next up, making the right connections. Maybe it is a dairy farmer in New Zealand. I don't know. Um, but you have to have a good idea of who that is because you have to be very intentional um, when you're reaching out to people. And one of the best ways to do that, or I'll give you a few, is the whole create then connect approach. So you would create content and then connect with anyone in your target audience who engages. So if I post something and Carrie says, hey, Terry, really good, thanks for sharing. I could then share, send her a connection request saying, hey, Carrie, glad you enjoyed my content. By the way, I see you talk about this, would love to connect, right? So that gives you an excuse to reach out to somebody, but you only do that if it's someone you actually want to engage with because it's, it's time consuming, right? So it wouldn't be something you do for everyone because it wouldn't make sense. But if it's someone that you really want to connect with, you would just reach out and say, hey, thanks for engaging. Would love to continue the conversation. I'd like to connect so I can follow your content as well. So that's one way to grow your network with intent. But you can't do that if you're not creating or sharing content, because you have no excuse. You can also reach out to high impact members and then just provide value in exchange for their attention. So the other day, some person reached out to me with a connection request. And I was like, OK, I'm, I'm bored. I'll accept it. And the guy reaches out to me and he says, hey, how are you doing? And I'm like, dude, come on, really? 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 So I'm like, how is <laughs> this is taking way too long? It's like, like, I don't like when people text me and say, hey. And those are my friends. So some random guy saying, hey, man, how are you doing? It's like, why are you curious? <laughs> you know, so just have something irrelevant to say. Don't just be like, hey, dude, what's up? Um, and it can be like, hey, you know, I'm reaching out because I, you know, I know you're in this industry and I found this really cool guide by General Assembly, you might want to look at, you know, or some new tool that came out you think is interesting, right? So it could be an interesting article or, hey, you're in project management. There's this really cool podcast about, you know, the top cities for project management people in 2021, so on and so forth, or a free webinar, which I just, we're doing that right now, right? Cool. Anyway, so I guess it worked if you're listening, but, um, but you know, so, so I'll give you an example here. I reached out to this woman and I said, hey, I'm totally coming out of the blue here, but I see that you're a consultant. So I want to invite you to this free webinar that I'm leading, how to shift your consulting business online. It takes place April 1st, so on and so forth. So I would send this as the connection request. And I've done this on a regular basis. And normally about 50% of people will accept my connection request when I do this. And I'm, that's, that's a pretty good number because I'm being overt. I'm not just saying, hey, you, sound, you seem really interesting. Let's connect. I'm like, hey, man, you want to come to this thing I'm doing? <laughs> and if they connect, sometimes they'll say, no, thank you, but I'd like to connect instead. So again, just reach out with some kind of value. Don't say, hey, how are you doing? Because unless that person's really bored, they're not going to respond. That's why you should always have something valuable planned or available for your target audience. And one thing you can have available is what's called a lead magnet. A lead magnet is a piece of content or information that's so valuable that your audience would exchange their email address for it if they saw it on your website. So it could be some guide to how to do branding for a nonprofit or you know, five tips for you know, starting your career over again um, in a new field, whatever it is. Except in this case, you're not going to necessarily ask them for their email address, you'll just reach out to them with a connection saying, 
hey, uh, it looks like you're changing careers. I'd love to share this guide with you, five ways to start over in a new industry. So on my website, it's this. It's the 10 biggest mistakes entrepreneurs make on social media and what you should do instead. So if you went to my website, you would give me your email address for this. If I reached out to you blindly on, on LinkedIn, I would say, hey, here's this guide. It looks like you've been posting a lot on social media. I dig it. By the way, I want to share this guide with you. So I'm going to stop and ask if there's any questions. If not, I'll just keep on plugging along here. We're good? Cool. Okay, I'm going to try to say something more interesting. So you ask questions. I'm going to try harder than a couple slides. See, see how that goes. Um, so again, another thing you can do is reach out with a genuine question or compliment. A genuine question, not how you're doing. A genuine question. And I'll give you an example. This guy, Max, reached out to me and said, hey, Terry, um, I saw that you had this article in the April edition of Entrepreneur Magazine, and I had an honest question. Did you mean for there to be a typo in the first sentence so that more people would engage with you like I am right now? No, Max, I just messed up. Um, <laughs> but thank you for asking me. <laughs> so I had this article in the print version of Entrepreneur Magazine, and there was a typo, and Max asked me if I did it on purpose. No, Max just can't spell. Um, but again, this is a very like thought out and research question, you know, he just reach out to me blindly. So what you can do is reach out, research people that are in your industry that you want to connect with, do some research on what they're doing. Hey, Kari, I see you're doing a lot of stuff with, um, with Palm Beach Tech, you know, I'm curious, you know, is that like um, something you've been working on for a while? What's the reception been like? You know, how can I participate? You know, whatever. But just be, make it obvious that you've actually been paying attention to what they're doing. So then reach out with a genuine question or compliment. Hey, Carl, you know, I saw that, you know, your last uh, webinar with that guy, Terry, had a thousand people sign up. Amazing. You know, congrats on that. Looking forward to the next one, right? Just something that shows you're not just blindly sending out connection requests. Here's something that I strongly recommend a lot of you consider as well. Do some kind of industry research that you can share with your audience. So again, let's say I am this person who wants to get a job in project management and I'm in between jobs or just graduated. I can compile all this industry research saying, hey, you know, what are your predictions for 2021? What do you think is going to be the biggest, you know, what's going to be the most impactful thing that goes on in project management? I'd love to interview you. And then reach out to 50 people that have project management roles at various organizations. You're going to interview them, compile those results, and then share those results once they're complete with that person. If you do this, you're going to make a ton of deep, deep, deep connections and at the same time, Position yourself as a thought opinion leader in your industry. So I want to say this again. This is going to be the easiest way. And I hate the word easy because everyone's like, sweet, I don't have to do anything. You got to do something. But it's going to be an, an easy way to make an impact. Reach out to 50 people. Say, I'm doing some research on the product management industry. I'd love to briefly interview you. Or can you fill out this survey? I'm going to compile the results and share it with my audience. And the benefit is when you do share that, you can share it in pieces. One tidbit I picked up from Alexandra was this, tag her in that post, then she might see it and share with her audience say, oh, I had a pleasure of being interviewed for Terry's guide. You know, thanks, Terry. Um, <laughs> should be more sincere than that, but you know what I mean? What I'm saying is like everyone that you interview, if you share their insights on LinkedIn, great, now you have even more stuff to talk about. It's that person earlier who said, hey, what if I have nothing to talk about? Go find it. And this is how you do it. But as you're sharing it, you have so much content, they're sharing it with their audience, and you're, you're elevating your platform as a thought opinion leader. Uh, this is my um, client, Lindsay, and she is a pilot, but she also realized that only 6% of pilots are women, and she wants to change that. So she did exactly what I said. She's interviewing 50 female pilots and trying to reverse engineer how they became successful pilots because she's creating a program where she goes to flight schools and teaches them how to attract and nurture more female pilots. And she's doing these 50 interviews. So she has this hashtag 50 fly girl interviews um, where once she, when she interviews people, she's gonna start posting about it and making it easier for you to follow along. But here's the thing. I told, or I, I, I consulted Lindsay and I told her to do this just like um, I'm telling you to. But while she was doing these interviews, these women were like, well, how about you go to my flight school and coach them. And she's like, well, do you want to make an introduction? Sure. So halfway through the interviews, she already had two people that wanted to hire her. And she wasn't even done yet. 
she's like, Terry, what do I do? They need a proposal by tomorrow. I'm like, you better stay up late because because <laughs> we didn't think it was going to happen this quickly, <laughs> but it did. So right now, if you're stuck, if you're going through, you're like, damn, what do I do? This, this is what you do. This is how you make your mark, right? And people are going to say, okay, what were you doing during COVID? Well, you know, I just wanted to stay fresh and just give something to the project management community. So I made this guide about the insights for 2021. And now I'm very clear on how it would help your company as well. I'd love to share it with you and discuss, you know, specifics about this role. If you do that, if you're that person, you're making everybody else look bad, right? <laughs> so be that person. It's something you can easily do. It takes no money whatsoever. It takes time, right? So please, please, if you're going through it, just try this because I know it's tough, but it wasn't, I don't want to say easy. It was not this clear <laughs> how you can make an impact years ago, but now it is. Uh, and then lastly, play the long game. And by that, I mean, just focus on building relationships. What can you learn from people? What can you contribute to them? Instead of saying, okay, well, how can I get a job from this person? Or how can I sell them something? So play that long game because when you project lack and scarcity, people can smell it a mile away, right? But if you have that genuine question, if you're just reaching out and saying, I'd love to interview you, they pick up on that. And maybe not tomorrow, maybe not the next week, but over the, over several months, that's how you're building this, this network of people who know, like, and trust you and will want to help you. So next steps, uh, do all that stuff. Um, so again, research these keywords, get that content out. If you can't create content, engage. And also lastly, when you do connect with people, provide some value in exchange for their attention. So that's me, that's what I got. Um, here's all my information. I'll give a link to my LinkedIn as well. I'll put that right in the chat, but I'd love to answer any questions that you have. So it says, I was asked this question recently and would love to hear your point of view, Terry. What do you think of adding all degrees, certifications, videos, awards, articles, volunteering? People have a tendency to share accolades and not how they can help you. Is there such thing as too much info share? I think there's too much, is, there's such thing as too much info share, but it's just not even close to relevant to your job. So um, like, for example, I'm like, I'm infant CPR certified. Nobody really cares, right? Um, but I think you can show some of your personality by some of your volunteer work. So if you volunteer at the Boys and Girls Club of, of Brooklyn, maybe that's not gonna help you be a better project manager, but it shows who you are as a person. So I, I do think it makes sense to, to post these, these accolades because it sets you apart from other people so long as it is somewhat contextually relevant to what you wanna do. Similarly, I have a question about frequency. Is there such thing as too much posting and too much content sharing? And how does that affect either the algorithm or how you appear on people's feeds? Posting frequently helps. So if you can post, let's say even four or five times a week, that helps because that trains the algorithm to say, all right, well, when Carrie posts, Terry engages. So, okay, well, you know, he's been posting pretty regularly. So let's keep on showing this to Carrie. Whereas if you just kind of show up once in a while, the algorithm has not functioned or has not factored you into what content Carrie should see because you post so infrequently. But that said, I mean, I post less than I think some of my peers. Um, sometimes it's only once a week, but when I do, and I'm not saying it's a, a metric of success, I'll get like 8,000 views and like a bunch of engagement because it's like, it's high quality content. But before, um, before like COVID, I was posting like three or four times a week. And I did see an uptick of people reaching out to me, literally saying, well, I see you're posting more often. So it's beneficial, but that's why you have to make it easy to post. Don't sit there and say, oh, how do I sound brilliant right now? You can just say, look, here's what I'm experiencing. Here's how my day went. I'm going to share it and make it relevant to my audience, but don't feel pressure to sound brilliant all the time. Just kind of exist and share that with your audience. Um, what about video versus a static images? Any suggestions there? Well, two th one thing is like, if I think video is beneficial, I think it's a great way to show your personality, but if it stops you from creating content because you're taking forever to create these videos, then you're better off just posting. Um, and on my end, like I, I look at my views for videos versus views for posts. Often my posts just with text get more get more reach and engagement than posts with videos um, or uh, more pictures. But there was a video I posted maybe six months ago, maybe got like 2000 views. But from that, I got two clients from it because I told the story of my why more or less. 
So I think it's good to experiment with that, but you have to have KPIs. What is your key performance indicator of what good means? Are people reaching out to you saying, hey, I saw your video, love to talk. Or are they saying, I saw your post, would love to talk. <laughs> so it's really like, what are you getting from it? Not like what are experts telling you to do? So experiment with both. And then from there, you can see what's working, what's not working. Yeah, that's a perfect gateway to another question, which is how do you connect engagement to actual metrics of success for business and ROI? So how do we, how does a currency of engagement actually translate to dollars? A few ways. One is if you're linking back to your website, you can look at your Google analytics and see what website traffic came from LinkedIn and led to success. Another is you actually have to keep track of being the relationships you're starting on LinkedIn saying, okay, I met this person because I saw this post. And you can do that in a CRM system like HubSpot, where you're literally tracking these things. Or if you want to go lo-fi, you can just have like a Google sheet, but it's on you to track these things because otherwise it's, it's very unclear of like, if it, is it worth it? But that said, there's also a halo effect. And a halo effect is when your activities on one platform influence actions on another platform. So that guy, Justin, that I talked about, he often says some very personal things like, you know, you have this job, but you're frustrated and, and hate your life. No one's going to like that. But what they'll do is that same day, they'll direct message him or they'll go to his website and fill out a form. So it's really on you to stay on top of these things in regards to what reward you're getting from your content. And finally, one last question is, um, how are you using or leveraging LinkedIn groups? I'm not. And I'll tell you why. <sighs> I feel like sometimes people are in there just to talk about themselves. And that's just maybe my experience, but I have yet to find one in my experience that's been super beneficial. But that said, um, going back to that woman, Lindsay, she's been doing really well in groups by fighting groups that are aligned with like women's empowerment and um, along that line of what she's trying to accomplish. So me personally, I don't really engage with them as much. I, I find more benefit in just having like one-on-one -on -one conversations as opposed to being in a group saying, I hope someone sees this. But what I will do is I'll see someone post in a group, then I'll direct message them. Hey, I saw you post in this group. I thought it was great. And that's been beneficial. So for me, I use groups as a way to aggregate who I want to reach out to. And then I'll reach out to it one-on-one -on -one as opposed to just posting in the group because I want my content to get shared among a larger audience, not just silo to that group. And one last one, is it beneficial to stay consistent in uh, just one industry? Post, comments, likes, shares. I think it's beneficial to have a very clear understanding of who you want to get in front of. And if that is industry specific, then yes. But um, I think there's a benefit in just being aware of what's going on in other industries as well, if that leads to developing your personal brand. So on my end, like I'm not in the retail industry whatsoever, but during COVID, you know, a lot of them are shutting down and I can say, well, here's what's going on in retail. And I think that's why we'll see more people joining the knowledge economy where you get shared, you get paid for sharing your knowledge as opposed to having a fiscal good. So again, that's not my, my lane retail, but I can at least speak to what's going on there and say how it relates to what I do and how I help people. Yeah. And I actually have a quick question. Um, what about the about me section? Like, it, do you think it's better to just keep it short and sweet? Should you make it a little bit longer, share your story or what have you seen that's worked? Or do people actually read it? <laughs> yeah, well, it matters for a few reasons. One is you show up for the keywords that are in that section, but I want you to think about it this way. It's not an about me section, it's an about you section. And the about you is the audience. Mm -hmm. So you would tell the story of your audience, hey, are you trying to solve this challenge? Need help with this? Here's how I can help. So for me as a consultant, I would say, you know, are you trying to book paid speaking gigs? Are you trying to get, you know, clients for your consulting business? I know it's frustrating. Here's how I can help. So just mention you more often, meaning that the audience, not yourself, don't just like regurgitate your resume. Because again, that's your opportunity to create um, a more personal connection. So talk more about the audience and show that you, you understand them. You're empathizing with them. Oh, I get it. You're trying to find this. Or you need this. Or you've done this before. I'm here to help. So that's what I would say on that part. Okay. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. Um, Carrie, do we have any other questions or are we good to wrap it up today? On Facebook, 
Any last minute questions? Gary, you were on mute. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Yeah, I don't see any questions from any other social media platforms, actually. That was quite a few for the end, so that was good. Yeah, no, I mean, Terry, you did an amazing job. I literally have like a whole notebook of notes. Um, I'm looking to implement this right after, after this um, workshop, but thank you so much for joining us all the way from Brooklyn. Carrie, you've been great. General Assembly is awesome. We're so happy to have you guys as a member at Palm Beach Tech. Um, we'll definitely be sending out a follow-up email to anyone who's missed this. But thank you again. Thank you all for joining us. Um, Kara, if you have any last minute words on any upcoming events you would like to share? Uh, yes, we're actually gonna be sending also some um, discount codes. So the Palm Beach Tech community gets 30% uh, off any General Assembly workshop around uh, data, coding, UX design, obviously digital marketing. We're going to be sending this recording and we're going to be connecting you directly to Terry so that you can continue to ask questions that are more specific to lead generation for your own industry and your own business. Um, so be on the lookout for that. And, um, and as always, if you need help with transitioning into a new career in tech, you can connect with me personally. I'll send over uh, my email as well through, um, through Palm Beach Tech. Terry, close us out. Yeah, well... Thanks again for having me. This has been great and it helps me feel normal during abnormal times. So I appreciate that. Um, but to everybody else, um, feel free to reach out on LinkedIn. I'm looking forward to seeing what you share, how you update your profile and uh, supporting you along the way. So thank you for this. Yeah. Well, thank you, Terry. I hope everybody has a great weekend, a safe weekend, and we'll definitely be in touch. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.